the whale store? Yeah. We had a good time. That was fun. Meeting of the Capitola City Council is now in regular session. We've done presentations, uh, excuse me, pledge announcement. So now we move on to presentations. Pledge of Allegiance. Scott, oh, Pledge of Allegiance. I'm awfully sorry. Okay. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. With that, I welcome Scott, and uh, you have others with you? I have others with me, yeah. I see. Thanks for having us. Uh, we're here to talk about our Measure C. Whoops. Thank you. We're here to talk about our Measure C general obligation mm -hmm. bond. Uh, my name is Scott Turnbull. I'm superintendent of Soquel Union Elementary School District, of which New Brighton Middle School is one of our schools right here in Capitola. Um, so with me tonight is our CBO and Assistant Superintendent of Business, Michelle Kennedy, and our Bond and Facilities Manager, Jim Dupre. So just a real quick background, because I know our time is uh, tight. We, um, back in 2016, we took to the voters um, a $42 million general obligation bond and got the support of the community with uh, about 72% of uh, voter approval. Uh, we were able to, we're now um, on pace to be able to replace all our outdated um, portable classrooms with new modern uh, facilities that you're gonna hear about tonight. And we're just very appreciative um, of the community support. And we do have a citizens oversight committee that keeps the district accountable, of which uh, Steve Jesberg is one of our members. And uh, it's a, r a great committee that um, uh, really works with us to make sure we're on point. The last thing I'll say um, before you hear from everybody else is that we were um, pretty bold and pretty public about our goals of getting all of this work done by um, the time school starts in August of 2019. And uh, a, a rare instance of a construction program, we are on point with that original goal. So we're really proud of that. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleagues. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about the money, being the money person. <laughs> Give you a slight overview of our project, and then Jim is gonna talk to you guys about some of the pictures we have in the presentation uh, regarding our three elementaries and our middle school. So as you can, as Scott had mentioned, in November 16, we passed the bond, and we are just over two years now into the bond project, and very proud to say, like, we are on schedule, on time for opening for summer for school year 2019, which is just three years in after passing a $42 million bond. Part of that program is 33 new classrooms district wide. That's replacing 39 portables that were failing the district that were some up to 40 years old. Uh, new Brighton specifically, we have our art studio and our wood shop complex at New Brighton. Uh, that project is coming in about $2.2 million of the $42 million that was passed. Our boys and girls locker room at New Brighton is coming in um, along with our dance and weight rooms. We put that project as one. That's coming in at just over $4 million. And the six classroom wing at New Brighton is coming in at just over $6.2 million. So in total, that's $12.5 million of the $42 million that we are spending here at New Brighton and that is roughly 30% of our overall bond project. Um, at the three elementaries, we have student new student restrooms going in. Uh, we have a science and music room up at Santa Cruz Gardens with a roll-up door. It's very beautiful if you get a chance to get up there. Uh, we have two um, of our sites, Main Street and Soquel, that are two-story classrooms, and we have a science uh, life lab and art room both at uh, Soquel and Main Street for outdoor area. Um, so Kel, we just partnered with um, the county and they're doing a restoration project behind the creek area. So we're hoping to do our science outdoor next year. And so uh, with that, I'm gonna turn you over to Jim. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks for having us. Um, so we'll go, go through this really pretty quickly. Uh, these are uh, shots from our elementary school. Uh, upper uh, left there is a overhead shot of the two-story building going in at Soka Elementary School. Um, as you can see, so we've got some of the roofing going in and the, sec the, the deck between the first and second floor is all in. 
Uh, Main Street was a little bit behind that. That's the steel superstructure, and we've made some progress since this picture was taken. And uh, below at uh, Santa Cruz Gardens, that's a kindergarten classroom, which has already been inhabited. We've got kids moved into the kindergarten and to a special ed classroom uh, already, and the music uh, room will be moved into uh, over spring break, so we're really excited about that. Um, these are some 3D artist renderings of the three buildings we're doing at New Brighton. Upper left is the art and wood shop uh, complex, and then on the right-hand side is the PE department with the locker rooms. You know, the boys and girls have been changing in outdated portables uh, forever. And then below that is the uh, classroom wing, which is closest to the district office, and uh, we'll have a nice new entry uh, pickup area for parents. Uh, this is a pretty up-to-date picture. Actually, not really, because we've now got some color coat. This is the uh, art and wood shop complex. Uh, our builders are saying this is a high school quality wood shop that they're building for us here at the junior high. We're very excited about that, and the art studio will have a kiln room and plenty of room to spread out and do all the amazing things that uh, Roy Segura does there at, uh, at the junior high. Uh, interior shot, just showing that we're moving along. You know, things are happening really quickly. A lot of, uh, lot of infrastructure in this one, tons of power and things like that, especially in a wood shop. Uh, so uh, uh, we're moving along pretty quick with that one. Um, this is a picture of one of our inside of one of our classroom buildings. It's a teaching wall, which is pretty standard throughout the district in our new buildings. And in this teaching wall, there'll be sliding whiteboards that'll cover most of those cupboards. And in that big white area, all the classrooms uh, district-wide will be getting 70-inch TVs that will hook into uh, Chromecast and their, their dock cameras and give them almost like a 3D quality. Uh, for and the kids will be really able to see it. And so we're really excited that we're moving forward with that. Nice high ceilings too, I love that, a lot of, lot of volume. Um, this is the exterior of that building. Um, the rain has not been friends to us. Um, I'm the only guy in California rooting for a drought, but uh, we're moving along, uh, making progress. We're mostly out outside of the outside of this building. Uh, the painters have been slowed down a little bit. Uh, this is the interior of the dance and weight room. Uh, it looks like one big room, but we have a, a, a demising wall that moves in the center. We can cut it into two spaces, so two teachers can use groups at the same time, or they can open it up and do what they need to do in there. Uh, we're getting a, a, a nice soft surface floor. It's going to be installed in the next week or so. And then uh, this is the interior of the locker room. Uh, we have a pour-in place uh, epoxy floor in there that will probably outlive all of us, which, are, which is great for care. Uh, it's waterproof, mm -hmm. it's slip resistant. The little uh, curbs you see are where the lockers are going. Every student will have their own locker for the first time ever. Um, and then we're shooting for, uh, they, they plan on turning all these buildings over to us on July 15th. That'll give the district some time to uh, put together furniture, move things in, get things where people want them, and um, we'll and be able to take a deep breath and say, wow. So uh, that's where we are. Uh, I will, we will all gladly take questions if you have them. Any yes. Questions, Sam? Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Scott, Michelle, Jim, for coming and uh, giving us an update and a presentation on what I, I consider very sorely needed new facilities for uh, our children here. Um, my question is, um, when it is completed, are you going to have like a public open house and invite the community Absolutely. to come and do some tours? I, I think that I know I would love to do that and uh, would a appreciate hearing about that. Absolutely. We don't have anything on the calendar yet, but um, besides our ribbon cutting ceremony, we will definitely have some open house type events. Uh, let everybody come in and see the cool stuff. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. Uh, that was the question I was going to ask, but I do want to say um, that I'm I'm really pleased to see that some of these buildings are going towards arts programs that otherwise you're we're seeing removed from schools nowadays, and so I'm really um, I'm happy to see that. Yeah, our art and woodshop. If you ever get a chance to come over and see them, they are state of the art. We have great teachers in there, and uh, and we're finally going to have the facilities to match the quality of the instruction mm -hmm. in there. So yeah, thank you. Ed? I, I just want to say congratulations for being on time and on budget. That's really an accomplishment. Ooh. You should be proud. A great team. Um, our team here put a, put a great team, good construction manager and amazing architect. Um, and our, our board has been very supportive too, of which Phil Rodriguez, trustee, is here tonight too, I should mention. So thank you. With the little one coming into the school district, I am really excited to see the upgrades and just really looking forward to having her begin her entire education with SoCal Elementary. So yeah. yeah. 
She'll never know the difference, right? She won't. <laughs> <laughs> just be her norm. Yeah, we are too. And uh, those two-story classrooms at the at Soquel on Main Street are just amazing. Um, and what a space saver, you know, because not not just here, but especially here, every square foot of uh, you know land is so valuable. And so we're we're able to get twice as many classrooms in there and still conserve the recreation area. So she's gonna have a good time. So Scott, I did not know you were a band director. <laughs> I am very far from a band director. Uh, <laughs> you were there the other night, right, yes, at our community forum. <laughs> yeah, please comment. I'm, I was very impressed with your band, and um, even though you were yeah. directing, it was wonderful music. <laughs> and uh, you've I expanded the program. Can you go into that, please? I, I sure can. Um, so I got to give credit where credit is due. Uh, that was Craig Broadhurst, the principal, that was uh, directing the band. So, um, but um, our band is. We just have been, been able to cobble together a little bit of money, um, and ha we have a one class at New Brighton. They play the other night at our community forum and were amazingly good for the amount of time that they've been together as a band. So, um, you know, we're, we, we value music education. Um, unfortunately, we, we, uh, we didn't get our parcel tax passed. That was one way that we were going to try to fund a more full-fledged district-wide music program. Um, but we, we, we do the best we can with, uh, with the scraps that we have. Okay, I won't confuse the two of you next time, but uh, no, I was very impressed. He's the better it. looking one. Yeah, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and you saved the lemon tree. I, I do have one question. Um, so for the life lab, you know, the, the gardens and stuff like that that were taken out, what are the plans for that in the new Brighton? Um, so yeah, those um, will be replaced um, back um, when, when we um, finish the project. And in fact, Jim might be able to talk about this a little um, more, but um, the classroom that's closest to that garden now will kind of be set up to, to um, support a life lab opportunity where there will be a sink and everything. And anything you want to add to that, Jim? As we were moving through, and that it came that 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 end classroom uh, on that wing is, is backed right up to what is going to be the garden. Uh, we decided to put a back door on that classroom mm -hmm. at a little bit of a cost to us, just so that the kids could have easy access to that garden and easy back into the classroom, uh, and it just so that those two those two classrooms kind of marry together, uh, making it a, a little bit of a specialty classroom. But how it, the garden is very important, and it will definitely uh, it'll definitely be replaced. It was kind of in disrepair, so now is a really good time to to make it uh, much much better. Yeah, no, that was important. I've been across the street for 20 years, and it comes up and down. And yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay. So any more questions? Okay. Uh, staff, any questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you all for the time. Thanks for Thank you. So let's see the presentations. Um, any report on closed session? The city met. Uh, City Council met, I should say, in closed session to discuss two items under the significant exposure to pending litigation, and the city has taken no reportable action. Thank you very much. With that, uh, do you any additional materials? Yes, we received additional material public comment on two items. For 9A, there were two, and for 9C, there were five items, two of which came in today, um, and those are at the dais, and they're also all public comment is available in back. Okay, thank you. Moving along, um, any deletions and additions to the agenda? Staff has no changes. Okay, thank you. Public comments. Now we have a time for public comment. Please keep your comments to three minutes. Thank you very much. And cover items not on the agenda. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, City Council people. Uh, yeah, the Pledge of Allegiance uh, missing out is not a big thing compared to your oath for office. And what I'm talking about is the uh, surrendering of local government by city councils throughout the Monterey Bay region to a Soviet called AMBAG. Um, the whole state of California is covered by councils of government. You look up CalCog, there's not a square inch of California that's not covered by it. It's run, uh, you'll see the emblem every place and everywhere of ICLEI, which is a front for the World Bank and the United Nations. Uh, they intend to reduce the local and county governments by 80%, according to Lenny uh, Mendonca, who's the co-chairman of Leon Panetta's California Forward. Um, some years ago, uh, when Gary Patton was head of the uh, Board of uh, Supervisors, he advocated one of these uh, uh, separate power companies uh, throughout the Monterey Bay area, and the 
the supervisor uh, from the South said this is a, a Fabian socialist proposal. The Fabian socialist emblem is a wolf in sheep's clothing. The person that did support it is Robbie Levy. Her petition was circulated by Hugh DeLacy, who was a communist espionage agent that gave information both to the Soviet Union and to communist China. Leon Panetta, when he was congressman, gave military and policy information uh, to this communist. Now, Gary Patton, um, that was advocating this, uh, according to a resolution here uh, by the Board of Supervisors, was supporting the communist takeover of Grenada, in which there were Soviet cruise ships in the harbor uh, the morning of the coup. There were uh, MiG-23s being uncrated. There were Soviet AK-47s. That Board of Supervisors still maintains uh, uh, honoring plaques to this communist Soviet agent. Uh, you can go to the Fabian Socialist Government. Uh, uh, the present chairman of the Board of Supervisors is Ryan Coonerty. He went to the uh, Fabian Socialist School in England. There is no change. Leon Panetta, Gary Patton attended a meeting at, at the Loudon Nelson Center um, and they honored Hugh DeLacy and his communist organizing wife, saying that they're, you know, they sign as comrades and they are in solidarity forever. This pleasant uh, present organization of Monterey Bay Community Power, their spokesman is advocating the separation of a separate communist state called Pacifica. And that's Mr. Jay Killigrew, and you've got Palacio, you've got Bruce McPherson, who received tens of thousands of dollars from a triple Chinese communist agent. I encourage you to wake up, pull out of the Soviet AM bag, pull out of Cal, uh, CalCog, and be independent and demand that you represent your city and the people that voted you here. Don't surrender your authority to AM bag, please. Thank you very much. Any other comments from the public? Please come forward. It's hard, it's hard to produce your own video, YouTube videos. But I want to be able to remind uh, uh, Capitola uh, residents what it is to be a good flag waving Americans because we are good people. I truly believe that. And this is a very welcoming uh, council and I do appreciate it. But I want to be able to share with members of the public uh, my latest book that I'm reading, Killers of the Flower Moon. Really great book, has a plethora of wonderful information, very illuminating. The protagonist reminds me of uh, uh, Zach Friend. But I want to be able to share with members of the public that uh, you know, I, I'm in the, I, I, I attend the County Board of Supervisors meeting, and they're in violation of the Brown Act. And so what we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do is trying to galvanize members of the public, because they're engaging in anti-dialogical action, anti-political, and anti-democratic. They're not allowing members of the public to weigh in on the political issue, <coughs> to make qualifying statements, to shape the rules that bind the rule. Um, and the consent agenda, they're, they have tackled that with the public comment, and this is a violation of the Brown Act, and I'm here to show uh, uh, um, Zach Friend and Carl Palacio, who resides in, uh, in Watsonville, and we attended that uh, public meeting, and they allowed us to participate in the consent agenda. This is <coughs> unacceptable. We're asking for members of the public to call up the County Board of uh, Supervisors and demand that they restore, take restorative action and allow members to weigh in on the consent agenda. It's imperative in order for the political community to grow and hear the public spirited perspective, they need members that will come and offer that, that don't come from the establishment. We're not anti-establishment, but we, what we wanna do is we wanna be able to affirm our democratic values. This is important. And so I'm, I want to be able to make uh, um, Capitola uh, residents aware that they're engaging in anti-dialogical action, which is a political dismembering of people that don't come from a wealth, power, and influence, which is shameful and egregious. So I thank you for your time, and I thank you for you guys being welcoming. God bless you guys, and God bless America. Thank you very much. Come forward, please. Hi, Council. My name is uh, Jason Shepherdson. I'm a doctor of physical therapy. I work at Ronning Physical Therapy right next to Bangkok West. Mm -hmm. um, more than anything, I just want to introduce myself to the Council and the community. Um, I've lived here on and on, on and off since uh, 2010, and um, really th um, going to put down roots here and um, just uh, plan on just being a part of the community, being a part of these meetings. 
and uh, more than anything, just to introduce myself. Thank you very much. I Thanks. wish you business success. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Seeing none, bring it back to city council and staff <coughs> comments. Um, who would like to start off? Any comments? Sam, Ed, no. I have that? No? no, no, Kristen. Okay. Um, I went to a wonderful meeting the other day. Uh, it's the uh, 2020 uh, census cut, uh, kickoff. Uh, you and I went. You, you wrote me into it. So now I'm part of this committee that will be uh, very actively engaged in trying to promote. Um, information about the uh, census, how important it is to this community. We need everyone counted so that this community can be funded for the operations and the services that we provide. If we don't get everyone counted in this community, we will be short the amounts that we need. And so it's very, it's very important to be <coughs> participating in this and spread the word. So that's my comments on that. Any city council comments? Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I just wanted to announce that today was a great day for our uh, cadets at the police academy. We have three cadets, as you know, in the academy, and today they made it through the, the midpoint examination, passed with flying colors, and moving on to the second phase of the academy. So I know several of our um, folks from the department were down there to see them through the process, and uh, we're excited to announce that progress. That's great. Good. So moving <coughs> on to consent calendar, is there a motion? I move approval of consent calendar. I'll okay. second. Okay, uh, before we vote on that, is there anyone in the audience that would like to come on the consent calendar or pull an item on the consent calendar? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. okay. Good evening, Over. City Council and Mayor. Uh, before you this evening is, um, I'm returning after the last meeting with slight modifications to the bicycle and PTD ordinance that was presented at the last hearing. Um, during the last meeting, first off, the, the ordinance has been drafted to bring it up to date with new bicycle parking standards that would be applicable throughout the city and also um, in preparation for a future bike share program and mm. should we decide to have also a, a scooter program. But um, our previous regulations were from, I think, 1951, so it was time to update. Um, so during the last hearing, we heard uh, concern for the bicycles on sidewalk standards. It previously, uh, the, draft, the previous draft um, prohibited PTDs, the personal transportation devices, and bicycles on sidewalks. The updates or the direction we heard from City Council was to allow children on the sidewalks as long as they're outside the village. And, um, and so in doing that, we, A, is to continue to prohibit PTDs on sidewalks. B, pro, um, states that no person shall ride a bicycle on a sidewalk and makes an exception for children. And in reviewing that, uh, we felt obligated to say that the child should be ride, riding in the same direction as traffic for their safety. We're setting this up for safety to allow children under the age of 10 on the sidewalk. So it would be unsafe for them to ride against traffic. Mm -hmm. So we added that. And then um, s standard C is defining that children of all ages um, are not allowed to ride bicycles within the village. And we thought the best um, technique or to put into the ordinance would be to define the village location the same as skateboards, mm -hmm. because really that the location of the skateboard ordinance is based on elevation and before you would go down and ascend, it, descend into the village and to slow people down. So at that point, anyone on a bicycle should either ride in the bike lanes or children should r walk their bicycles through the village. So that was the first change that took place. Second, there was a uh, conversation about the single file standard that was added to the previous draft. Um, in doing more research, I thought it would be more appropriate to add the state code for bicycles and roadways. This talks about, um, the section of code was um, added as an exhibit, but really talks about um, how bicycles should um, interact while on the street and when they pass. and. Um, there's no regulation stating that they have to be single file as long as they're in the bike lane or passing in the appropriate manner. So with that, 
those are the two big updates to the ordinance since we last met. And I'm recommending approval of the first reading of the new draft ordinance um, that would amend Chapter 10.04 General Provisions, repeal Chapter 10.44 Bicycles, and adopt Chapter 10.44 Bicycles and Personal Transportation Devices. Thank you very much. Is there questions coming from this board? Sam? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just one question, and as a matter of clarification, it's okay for young children to walk their bicycles on the sidewalk? They can walk their bicycles in? on the sidewalk <coughs> inside or outside of the village, yes. Okay, <coughs> all right, yeah. thank you. Okay, any other questions? I have no questions. Any questions from the audience? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to City Council for direction. Motion to approve staff recommendation. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, moving on to item B. Introduce an ordinance amending chapters 2.04, 2.08, and 6.14. Um, we are here tonight with the first reading of an ordinance that is the final phase of our efforts to transition from an elected to an appointed treasurer. Um, this process began with the passage of Measure K by the voters, at which point we eliminated any references to an elected treasurer from the municipal code. Um, and then in January, the council discussed options for the approach to appoint a treasurer. Um, and we have come up with, uh, we brought forth all of the other elements and have incorporated your direction. So the first item um, is the addition, which explains how we will, um, the two-part phase that was recommended by the council. Um, and that is to have the city manager appoint the finance director. That will then be brought to the council and the council will actually make the final appointment. And so that is a new section of code. Um, the next section um, is predominantly cleanup. Um, it removes outdated references to the redevelopment treasurer, a position that no longer exists. And it also adds um, the phrase allowing the finance director to serve as the treasurer. The next section um, allows for the city manager to remove the treasurer, so that is the strikeout portion. And then the highlighted portion is what um, would allow him to remove the finance director um, in the same manner that any other personnel would be able to rem be removed. So this portion refers back to the appointment, so that stays in place, and then this allows him to remove um, without other action. And then the final section, uh, we also did another cleanup action, which was to remove an outdated section requiring um, dog licenses to be reported to the treasurer for reasons that <coughs> no one was clear on. Um, so it's pretty straightforward cleanup. This is the first reading and we are recommending um, that you pass the first reading. Any questions of the city? <coughs> no. So the uh, city manager will recommend and the city council will approve Correct. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, no questions. Uh, any questions from the audience? Hearing none, come back to the City Council for direction. Is there a motion to approve this? A motion to approve staff recommendation. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> None opposed. Okay, so moving on to Central Village decorative lighting, item C. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, don't have a slideshow on this one. Um, item before you is uh, at the request of Council Member Bodorf to uh, at least have a discussion on the holiday lighting that was installed this year, uh, mainly along Capitol Ave, but also on the other trees within the village. Um, just a brief history, the city's involvement in, in the selection of lighting has always been only just to hang the lighting the uh, various businesses, or I understand the chamber at one point, actually purchased the lights and the public works department installs them um, and at their request. Uh, that also includes uh, installation of Christmas trees. Uh, historically, we had one Christmas tree, we put in the middle of the road, it's kind of moved off to the sidewalk and recently we've added more trees throughout the village. So um, that's it, we're looking from direction if the council wants to make any changes to that program in the future, thank you. 
Okay. Um, any questions of Steve? Yes. Yes, Sam. Thank you, Mayor. Steve, do we have an agreement with the BIA concerning um, uh, the lighting program? Um, no, there's never been a written agreement. It's kind of just been a, a handshake and uh, mm -hmm. a cooperation agreement that we've worked together on regarding that. And, and one follow-up, and some of the correspondence that I've received concerning it, I um, consistently ran over the word permanent lighting. Where, where does that come from? So historically what we've done is we've installed the lighting um, around Thanksgiving every year and left it up until the, the small lighting that we used for that would eventually fail and we leave it up until it failed and then we go back and take it down. So it would stay lit until it failed and then we'd replace it every Thanksgiving. So that's, I think it's anticipated that the rope lighting that has now been installed will last quite a bit longer and may last throughout the year. Okay, so the permanent means year-round and for the life of the lights? Right, and refreshing them and, you know, all this, yep. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, um, any questions from the attendees here on this particular item? Good evening, Karen. Good evening, Karen Hanna. Congratulations, congratulations on moving this right along. I said, ah, you don't have to be here before 7.30. <laughs> We're the third public hearing. So we do have um, several members of the BIA board here um, this evening. And uh, the, the history of the lighting and the, the word permanent that, that you mentioned, Sam, um, for about at least three years, it's probably more, but I'm trying not to exaggerate. Um, we have been talking to city staff, Jamie primarily, but a little bit to Steve as well, and about, and among the, the businesses down there, about how nice it would be to have the palm trees lit all year round. And we started investigating different methods to light the trees, rings that go up under the fronds, lights that are in the ground that shine up, um, the, the city even purchased one of the ring lights to test it out and it totally inadequate, didn't really light up the, the street at all. The village is very dark, there are not very many um, street lights there and the program that we've used for years and years of putting the, r the little twinkle lights on the palm trees is just it, it really sometimes they'd be vandalized within two or three days of putting them up. And it's just not practical for the city staff to go, the crew to go back and keep restringing those lights. So we would just let them fail and then sometimes it would be as early as the middle of January before we'd have to take them down. Sometimes we were able to get them to go till like April before they were just so raggedy it was an embarrassment. So the permanently lighting the palm trees has been something that's been talked about. There have been city council members at the BIA meetings. Um, over the years, and as I say, it's been it's been going on for a long time. So um, I think that uh, because of that, there just there didn't seem to be any, um, and because of the what we've be always been doing in the past, reason to come and get a permit. You know, because we just, honestly, those of us who've been involved in that particular project for three years just thought, well, everybody knows we're trying to do this and nobody seems to have any issue with it. The, um, so we investigated the different methods of lighting the trees, uh, like those ring lights or the, or the lights in the ground could cost as much as $30,000 to install. And that just, you know, that was a problem. We talked about, oh, well, maybe we could not have free parking one, ye one year at Christmas and the BIA could pay for half and the city could pay for half and that sort of thing. Um, anyway, this is the, the affordable program that we finally eliminated all other possibilities. This was the only way to light it. Um, I think our letter from the BIA pretty well states that, you know, it, it's affordable. It does a good job of illuminating the sidewalks where there are no street lights. Um, and uh, it's um, the maintenance issue, they're very, they're very durable. So the maintenance issue, they're very hard to vandalize. So that's another very important issue for us. Um, so I think that, you know, whether or not we got a permit, is kind of a little bit of a you know red herring. I think it's really a matter of you know are some of these res are some of the residents 
able to dictate what the look of the village is. I, I, I'm sorry that the letter came so late. The email was supposed to go out in time to go out. And, um, but it's, it, it's the look that we want for the future of Capitola. It's bright, it's contemporary, it's clean. Uh, the city crew did an awesome job making them straight, because those lights can be a mess. And we have more lights to put up, but obviously with this controversy, we're just holding them in storage. If we have to take the lights down, they're useless, they're valueless, and I'm not sure we'll see anything, you know, what, I don't know wh whether we'll be able to replace them or not. So I sincerely hope, I think that a lot of the fervor of, oh my God, what's happened to our charming s town, it's not dingy anymore, you know, it's all of a sudden it's bright and, and crisp, you know, we don't like that, we want it to be dingy and have yellow lights up there. So um, hopefully you'll, you'll uh, let us um, leave them up and let people get used to them, which I think seems to be happening um, mm -hmm. now. So mm -hmm. thanks for your time. Thank you, Karen. Um, any others from the BIA um, board? I'd love to hear your comments. Thank you. I'm Rodney Wartzlock with Capitola Candy Company and also a BIA board member. Something I'd like to add on top of what she said is we did speak with a lighting specialist, took pictures of the entire village. I sent them off to them and one of the things I heard was they've implemented these same lights in the warm white versus the cool white in other beach towns and they've removed them kind of like what we're going through right now. People aren't liking the bright mm. and they had to remove them and they, they went to the bright and people liked them better. The reason why they went with the, the bright is because when the warm white is put against the trees it looks muddy oh. this has been implemented on wooden bridges and they've taken it off before because it really makes it just look kind of dingy muddy when you put them against it we tested a little piece of it on at nighttime and it, it does it, it doesn't give the light the right brightness it's just a lot safer now down in the village at night and i do tend to stay open a lot later than other businesses sometimes 10 o'clock at night and it does bring in a lot more business for us. I mean, we're hurting down there during this for these winter s seasons and can use every little bit of help we can get. Mm -hmm. And this is a help. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you stay open pretty late, so uh, you see this. I do. Yes, thank you. And I'd like to add, there's never been a complaint from a visitor about that. Never been a complaint. They've all felt very safe. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from the public? I see someone coming forward. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. How are we doing? Um, Josh Fisher, I own Left Coast Sausage Works, uh, also board member of BIA and board member of Capitola Foundation. Um, I've lived down here now for five years in the village. Um, I've worked down here in the village for also five years. I uh, own my own business now for three. and. Uh, in the last five years, I think I've seen one or two good attempts, as Karin was saying, uh, to keep the, the lights up. And they've, you know, looked decent at times, but they've always fallen apart. And then the city crew has to go back and spend time and money, <coughs> excuse me, taking them down and then replacing them again, and then taking them down and replacing them again. Uh, these ones have longevity they look really nice, they're bright. It's much safer down on Cap Ave, which was very dark before. It would be really nice to see it from Monterey all the way up to Bay Avenue, and maybe even potentially on Stockton Bridge and in other areas and really, really tie in um, the inner village. But I really think it looks really good and there was a lot of hard work and a lot of hours put in. Um, so I hope that we can work around this and leave them up and potentially add more. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the audience? Seeing none, I bring it back to the board for um, discussion. Um, Ed, can you lead off? You brought this to the board. Sure. <coughs> I, I, it was my idea to put this on the agenda because uh, um, I think it's time for a little clarification on what happened. It's how this started was uh, the lights uh, were installed and the media there was comment. And you know, the one thing we can talk about, and, and it's not really factual, it's an opinion is do you like them or do you not like them? And it was all over the the uh, the planet as far as what people thought. There was uh, there were some people who didn't care, some people didn't like them, some people did. 
But what's important, I think, and the reason that I put it on the council agenda is, is I think this, we need to go back, and I, it's, it's my obligation, I think, since I've been the representative to the BIA for the past three years, is to explain a little bit of the history of how this how this came about. And Karen touched on it. She started the story it, it, about three years ago. It was uh, brought up at a BIA meeting that they needed to do some, they'd like to do some enhancements to the palm tree lights. And there was a subcommittee formed, and the people on that subcommittee pretty much didn't do anything for about a year. And then after about a year, another uh, subcommittee person took over, and I, I was the liaison with, with the, those committees at both times. And uh, about midway through eight, 2018, it was suggested that we uh, you know, go get a palm light. And uh, I, all I asked for was that they make a recommendation of what they'd like it to look like. Uh, they gave me a picture of the one they liked, brought it to this, I, at that point I had suggested that to do the trial program, I would buy the light personally just so we could see what it looked like. Because I felt it was important to see that these, these lights run about five to $800 depending on the diameter. And before we spend $20,000 on an illumination plan, it'd be nice to see if it works. So um, city manager advised me that it would be not good for me to personally buy one. So the city went ahead and bought the uh, one life, Steve did. We bought it, we mounted it, we, uh, it came with four lights. We tried two lights up, two lights down, four lights up. And as Karn mentioned, it, you know, the illumination of those uh, palm tree lights was ineffective because they, they conflicted with the street lights we had. Uh, the pictures we saw in Palm Springs where it was done and it was really classy was that that's the only lighting they had on the street and they might have had some more intense bulbs, I'm not sure. But um, with our lights, there was a conflict with the street lights. So that kind of fell by the wayside, and then there was uh, um, more discussion about you know some kind of lights. And there was a well, the, the most I can look back on from the records of the BIA meetings was maybe street sidewalk conversations about g getting some rope lights. Um, there was never a BIA meeting where there was they voted on doing lights. There was never a subcommittee that I went to where they voted on lights. Um, they bought the rope lights, they gave them to the city manager, I mean to the uh, public works department, and the history, as Steve mentioned, was they would buy the lights, give them to the city, and the city would just figure that these are the same kind of lights and install them. And what, what this opens up for us is, is that, you know, if, the, if they would have gone and bought purple lights, and then we, we hung them, you know, it, it's what control do we have, should the city have over the village? I know, uh, I've been here 10 years, and uh, when I got involved on the city council, the first thing they told me was, don't mess with the charm of the village. It was driven in very hard. I mean, we talked about building a village hotel, we talked about all kinds of things in the village, and it was always made clear that there was this charming appeal of the village. So I'm, you know, I'm protecting that is what I feel. And, and uh, like I say, we can get back to the opinion about what we like or don't like, but, um, what, what really makes this, you know, with how this translated was, is the BIA never really approved buying any lights. There was a private donor that donated approximately, I'm gonna say between four and $5,000 to buy these lights. They were handed over to Public Works and, and you know, kudos to Public Works. They went out, they took it <coughs> seriously. They, I think they meticulously hung those lights, which is a credit to them. The problem is they changed the complexion of what the theme in the village was. The village has always been the soft lights and now there's neon. So um, the, the comment period starts. I think they went out to, uh, how did that work? They went to uh, Facebook, um, there was a next door item. I actually went to the um, next door site, uh, looked up what it was. Um, there was uh, six people locally that liked them, total of 11 that liked them. There's 23 people locally that didn't like them and a total of 44 that didn't like them. And it was, it was funny because there were a couple letters. You know, one letter kind of just really, the one we have on here that came to us tonight, it was, uh, hi, I love the lights, hate the color, which pretty much summed up what most people did. The idea of the lights was a fabulous idea. The process never really existed. There wasn't a process where, where you know, if, if I was intricately involved with the, with the BIA and all these meetings, I never knew the lights were going up or there'd been a change. And then there was one letter where somebody wrote that, you know, um, um, people in the, let's see, only people that should vote on the lights are people that live in the village or work in the village. And I, I, I wanna send a message to the BIA, you should probably rethink that thought. 
Because if it was only the people that work in the village and live in the city, you would have no business. People that come to the village predominantly are visitors from far away. So their opinion does matter. So I, I, think, uh, I think you should always, you know, should rethink about how people feel when they, with the feeling they get from the village. And was mentioned, you know, with, the, with, with earlier, it's like, you know, we, we just passed with the TOT measure. Um, we now give an allocation of approximately $30,000 annually to the BIA, which is a significant jump for their budget. It pretty much almost doubles their budget. And part of that was we included in the language that we'd like to see them do some village enhancements. And part of that, you know, w was to be, if, if there was going to be purchasing these palm tree lights, they would be responsible for doing that. So, and there's also in there about, you know, buying Christmas trees and other things. And what I realized is, as Sam, you mentioned, you touched on it, we have no policy, we have no ordinance about what they're able to do. And it's like, is it just the whim of what the business decides to do? And, and should we be subject to that? Because I think that, uh, you know, I don't want to create a rivalry between the city council, the citizens, the BIA, and the tourists. But I, there should be some collective way that, um, you know, we sit and discuss things. And, and like what was done with the palm tree light, there was a trial. With these rope lights, there was no suggestion of, hey, we want to try a brighter white light. Let's buy a strand, let's wrap a tree, see what it looks like. I think this was a rush to get them in this year. The, and in, in that case, they bought the whole lock stock barrel for all the trees. And now we have a situation where, like I said, it, it, there's People that don't like it on next door 44, people that did like it 11. There's a significant complaint factor. And as you mentioned, Sam, I don't think people realize that it's not Christmas lights. Their intent is to be year round lights. And the fact is if because they are rope lights and they're more durable, uh, they may last all year long. They, they may not burn out. It, it's possible that they could, you know, I, I think I, I talked uh, with, with the person that bought them and they said that they think they could last for two or three years. So we're talking about a permanent like and a permanent l look that we want in the village and uh, I'm just thinking that there should be some, the city should have uh, ultimate control about what the village looks like. We, we have ordinances for signs, we have ordinances for, you know, um, what product they sell. There was a run there for a while where people were putting their wares outside the store and we had to go in there and do a cleanup because it's the obligation of the city to maintain that look of the village. And, and I understand that there is a, there's a desire to, and willingness to run a good productive business, but at the same time, there's that obligation. So um, the things that I'd like to do to, to bring it back to you to, tonight is, um, number one, I'd like to uh, make a motion that we, um, I won't make a motion yet, I'll, I'll wait for the discussion. But the two things that I wanna have in discussion tonight are, are whether or not we take the lights down and number two is, is to create some kind of an ordinance that gives guidelines for how uh, decorations of any type are established in the village. So I'll wait to hear other council people before we uh, make a motion. Who's next to weigh in? I can, I can go next. Yeah, okay. sure. Thank you, Vet. Sure. Um, so first I want to just appreciate the BIA for what for coming out tonight and for the work that you do and for even thinking about our village and really wanting to brighten that up. So, and I appreciate Councilman ba Batorf's uh, reflections on really everyone's input and the community's insights. Um, so there were a couple of things that, that, hi that were highlighted to me. Um, there was mentioned about expanding the lights and there was some mention of future use of the dollars that are coming in from the TOT and so the TOT tax. And so what that means for me is that there's just a kind of, there's a lot of unknown kind of from here on out with what the possibilities are and what the collaboration can be between our council and the BIA. And I hope that we can find or create an ordinance as suggested by Councilman Botworth um, so that we can continue this relationship with the BIA and really think about what's gonna happen um, in the future. In the meantime, I, I wouldn't want to see the lights taken down until there's some sort of agreement between the council and the BIA. I think we need to really work on this relationship and continue this relationship because it's all for the beauty of our own city. So, um, so at this point, I, I would say that I, I'm fine with them being up 
until we figure out a process and we come up with some sort of collaboration or collaborative effort between the two entities, ourselves and the BIA. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I also want to thank everyone for, for being here tonight and sharing your opinion on this. Um, I'll say right off the bat that I also don't think it would be wise to take these down um, definitely not right away, not right now, especially because we haven't seen the alternatives. We don't know what any other colored lights would look like. Um, and, I and I don't think that darkness is better than the lights that we have now. Um, I agree that we need to have some kind of collaboration as we move forward um, and that perhaps, you know, allow these lights to remain up for the uh, duration of their life. And then once those lights um, are, are dying or, or whatever the phrase may be, um, that we consider working together for what comes next in the future, not necessarily um, changing things right now. Um, one of the things that I, I am concerned about is, while I understand and agree with our city obligation for um, ensuring that the village looks a certain way, I'm concerned with how far that could potentially go. Are we gonna start telling people that they can't put Christmas lights in their window, or if we do, what color those Christmas lights can be because they don't match the tree lights? And I, you know, I, I can really see both sides of wanting it to be kind of cohesive and everything matches. And then at the other hand, I, I worry sometimes that we're just stepping way too far into what we want to um, regulate. So for the time being, I'll say I think we should keep the current lights. There's no reason to remove them altogether at this time. But I do think that as we move forward, we need to create a plan um, for us to all work together so that when these lights die, we have an opportunity to, um, to do something different. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, obviously, if, if there weren't complaints from the community, this wouldn't be here and us talking about it. Um, so, and and one of the difficulties is it's hard to tell where the city stops and the BIA begins because we truly are a partnership, um, and I think these kind of projects should be completed, entered into in a partnership fashion, so that we don't find ourselves faced with. Um, complaints about the lights and they do exist um, and I still hear them to this day um, and um, and if people are interested in hearing I mean the complaints that I hear from people is that they're too bright um, and they're not particularly interesting okay so um, so I, I that's where we are now I agree I don't think we should take them down but I think that we need to enter into a cooperative process because I don't think it's in the BIA's interest to have um, any kind of product down there that significant number of people are, are going to be turned off on about, and particularly uh, local residents. So um, I would hope that we could try to uh, acknowledge that and try to come up with um, a design that would be pleasing to uh, a greater numbers of people um, than the levels of complaints that we have heard uh, about the lights. Um, so um, with that, I, yeah, I think that we should um, try to enter into a process. One, and I think Kristen will respond to you, I think we're only talking about the lights that are in public spaces, not about any lights that are on private property but as you know we do control signage and lighting um, and that's all to try to maintain uh, the look and feel of the community they make a big difference um, and I think it is within the purview of the City Council to try to manage that but doing that within the context of the partnership and if it's for the sake of five thousand dollars I think maybe the city should even um, incur or, or uh, pay some of the expense of putting in um, lights. Um, so um, I, so I, I think that I would like to see us maybe um, forge something where we could enter into a dialogue with the BIA to discuss the lights, even uh, to confront the complaints that people have so um, we can see if we can address them. I don't know if the technology is there and if it isn't, it isn't. If that's the best that we can do under any circumstances, um, then we'll have to live with that. Um, but it seems that we could do a little research further um, with the cooperate with 
the, the city staff and see if we could come up with some alternatives um, to the LED lights. Um, a lot of people, um, they have difficulty with the LED lights because they're very bright. Um, and so I was hoping that we could at least enter into a discussion and a partnership with the BIA to try to uh, forge an alternative. In the meantime, let the lights that are there stay. Um, and, um, and I'm not sure if permanence is something that you want to, as an end goal, to try to attract reoccurring um, um, shoppers. Because um, my experience is shoppers are always looking at what's new, what's interesting, what's turning over, what's different, um, and having the same um, lights um, all the time, year round. I'm not sure if that's going to further your goals about attracting uh, uh, shoppers into the village. So just my thoughts, but I think that there seems to be a majority here to see if we could um, enter into some dialogue with the BIA um, and see if we could, um, you know, forge an alternative. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, Ed was ready for a motion. I, I see a couple issues here. And to me, the main one is process. Um, I, you know, we, as Sam said, we are in a partnership. And as Kristen said, uh, we don't want to be defining like all these laws and stuff like that, that sort of gets um, obtrusive. So trying to come up with some sort of way so that we could work better together in, in a formalized <coughs> manner, okay? Um, often I think there's problems when it's just sort of like a, a, an agreement. We always do it this way. And sometimes issues come up when that may be problematic because there's disagreement as to the result. But if we have a defined process where we agree to work together in a formalized way, then things like this probably would be ironed out in a better, better manner. So I think Ed talked about that, and I agree with that. Um, I'm in general agreement. I hate to take the things down after that huge investment, and I don't know what would happen uh, with this process, but that would come into play when they actually come to the, the end of their life. So I'll, I'll take a crack at a motion uh, based on the comments that I've heard here, if you guys are willing to listen. It's a, um, this will lend us to be a, like a five-part motion, okay? And the motion is, number one, leave the lights up. Number two, install no additional lights. Number three, install at the city's expense, to pick up on Sam here, uh, one tree with the, um, I'm gonna call them the soft lighting, uh, soft uh, as opposed to the LED lights. So we would have something to compare to. Um, direct staff to establish it's, uh, either a policy or an ordinance for uh, village enhancements. I, I would recommend a policy at this point. Pa pol fine, pa I, I, I put a slash order. So direct staff to develop a policy for what, what things we'd like to put under the purview that the city has to weigh in on prior to them being just randomly installed. And uh, last of all, I would encourage the BIA to uh, enlist uh, a new city council representative to attend their meetings. I know that a couple members here have expressed an entrance. We left it with the uh, BIA that it was up to them whether they would like to have somebody. And I think in cases like this, it behooves you to have someone at those meetings uh, to exchange with you. So uh, that's my motion. Got it. Is there a second on this? I'll second. Okay, thank you, Sam. There's a motion and a second. Can I request clarification hey. quickly? Sure. Yes, please. Um, so leave the lights up and then install no new lights. Does that just mean leave these up for as long as they're good or leave them up until we decide if we like what's on that one tree or how long? It's or leave them up for now, install another one to look at it, and, and then it will have to come back to the council whether they want to do to actually take them down or wait until they burn out and then replace them with the newer lights. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not adamant about doing that. I personally have an op opinion, but I'm trying to work with the VA. I'm trying to recognize the expense. Um, I'm open for input from the city manager if you're. I, I think one way to think about this is very likely what the policy will say. <clears throat> it'll be something along the lines of our special event policy, which basically will say that for decorations that are gonna be installed in public spaces in the village, that the council has to approve the plan. And if it's a recurring, it's the same thing year in and year out. We can 
you know, do it at a staff level. So presumably, if that becomes our policy, um, that's I'm thinking out loud here about what we want, how we might craft that. Then presumably, the BIA would be coming forward with the village decoration plan for this next year, presumably late fall or mm -hmm. something like that. And so at that point, then you could take a look at okay, so what is the decoration plan? What is the amortization schedule on the lights, or do we want to keep the lights? Um, so I think that may give you kind of a, a look ahead to where we could possibly end up. Okay, um, Deb. If I may, um, regarding the third line of that, the city at the city expense to do to add the one tree of soft lighting. From what I understand, there's revenue coming in from the TOT tax, and I'm not sure that this that should be at the city's expense. I think that with the new revenue the BIA is receiving, that this could be something that they could possibly take on. Okay. Okay. Any comments? I this is a ballpark. To do one tree would probably cost about $250. Okay. Can you accept 250 for that? For the city? Yeah. I mean, well, we, we have the budget for I mean, would, would you um, feel okay with that? Maybe this is part of the conversation that a representative from the city council has at during the BIA meeting and what that would look like. It would just be easier to expedite it if the city did it. I think it's a process. I, I, trying to, I mean, I think Steve would say that it would be in within the budget to spend $250 to yeah, decorate. Yeah, I don't think it would be that much. I did have a question about the type of light you're looking for on that. It would be the same type of rope light. Rope light so the, the, what I call mini lights, the individual lights as opposed to a rope light. Because you can get a rope light that is a softer, <coughs> color that we're more used to than the, the that's what light. I, that's what that was so, what I was asking it would be the same type of light only in the softer white so a rope light with rope light with, with soft lights to call it LED. soft light instead of daylight soft okay light. thank you exactly. and it probably as you say it's probably less than 200 yeah for one I think it's a couple mm -hmm. ropes which is probably under a hundred dollars okay, city manager you have a comment I guess the only other nuance here is is that my recommendation probably would be to have our staff research this a little bit and we may want to potentially get two or three different types if we're going to be testing things out just because I'm not sure that necessarily we would nail it on the first try. I mean, I don't know if there's an obviously apparent uh, other alternative. So it may be that there's a couple different alternatives, not just one. I'm okay with that amendment to the, to the motion. Is the second okay with that? Second with Sam. Yes. Okay. Um, Sam, you had another comment? Well, I just wanted to, as a matter of clarification on uh, Kristen's question about uh, the no additional lights and leaving the lights up, my interpretation of that was that the program would not be expanded to other parts of the community, but if, let's say, a strand went out before we arrived at the alternative, that, that strand should be replaced. Um, because I don't, I don't think we want to have, you know, gaps and holes and that would be right. At this time, I would agree with that. It is, it, 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 they mentioned there were, they had additional lights. I, I wouldn't want to put them on more lights in different locations. I think maintaining prim primarily Capitol Avenue with, with the existing lights okay. is, is the okay. main theme. And the experiments could be done wherever uh, Public Works deems that they could be appropriately compared. Okay. And so, I, yeah, we, if, if there one were to burn out, but the, the, what we're getting at is, you know, we, we, I would really like to see, you know, we could get it done quickly because it'd be nice to just make a decision about which light is the appropriate light for the village. You're right. That's the idea. Well, the idea. Uh, I have a comment for your motion, and maybe if you could agree with this. So I see this, and you mentioned this, Sam. This is a partnership with the BI. Okay. So um, we all have different perspectives. I've had businesses before, and I remember my perspective on how the city dealt with me. And that is a perspective. We're, in a sense, representing the city here. I'd kind of like, Ed, if you would say in this motion that coming up with, um, Jamie, coming up with this proposal <laughs> on how we're going to work together, that this is done in concert with the BIA. So I don't want us coming up with a proposal that we put forth to a public forum, comment like here, I would like to have something that we've had some feedback from the BIA before we actually put it before the city council. Because to me, they're partners in this, in this city with us. So do you get the idea I'm talking about? I get it, but understand that you know, we pass ordinances in the village. There's an ordinance that says there's no neon lights in the village. Yeah. I mean, that's our job is to pass. And then, and then businesses, and just like with our signed ordinance, they, you know, we pass ordinances and then they, they adhere to that. And just like our entertainment permits, everything. 
So I think that the city manager should come up with the guidelines. I mean, it, 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 it shouldn't be a corroboration of, of, of what we will allow. We should say, hey, these are the things that, that matter to us as a city, and then you're allowed within certain guidelines to, you know, as Kristen mentioned, I, we're not saying you can't change your storefront. Your storefront is your storefront, but when you get onto city property, you know, anything that's, hang, that's hung on street lights or signs, you know, I think they just recently did banners for the season, okay, and that was run by us, and that was fine. It's just, these are just guidelines for, the, for them to use because we don't really have any guidelines. That's why we ended up with lighting that right is, that's questionable. Okay, th that's a fine answer. Okay, um, any other discussion, Christine? I see? just have a quick comment. I wasn't gonna bring it up because I didn't want to complicate things in, any further, um, but since our city manager mentioned having other options, uh, I think it's also worth looking at. I know that there's some kind of lights where you can adjust the color or mm. the colors change. Like when it's Valentine's Day, they put them, they make them red. And when it's St. Patrick's Day, they make them green. And that might be kind of cute. Or just, um, you know, lights that we can potentially dim or make brighter as one of our options. If we're going to be looking at options, um, I think that might be worth looking at. I'll, I'll help you with that because when they were doing the process, I remember they were looking at that because we had mentioned that. You know, wh why don't we put some lights around the trees that you could change colors? On Valentine's Day, we could light them red. And as Sam mentioned, you know, what you, what you bring people in to draw is when you change it up. And I think what they came back to me was is the lights that they ended up buying, the, the brand, the strand, what everything about it is, they're durable. Those ones that were interchangeable that changed lights were not as right. reliable. And so the, the lights that are actually hung there, the quality of those lights, they come in sections, and if a section goes bad, you're able to change that section without doing a whole light. So there was a lot of thought put into the type and quality of light. Uh, the only m the, the question right now is the, is the color. Fair okay, enough. But so that's why they, but I, I, we had, I, I thought that was a great idea. He's like, you know, on green for Easter and red for Valentine's Day, it would, you know. Anyway, they weren't good lights. They weren't as good quality of lights. Okay, I think, uh, any more comments from the board here? Okay, Maybe Sam? Just one more question. On that last point, Ed, I, I assume that means you um, want to remove yourself as the representative to the I already, BI, I've already done that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I withdrew, okay. and then I, and I mentioned to the B. I I went to the last meeting, and I told them, I said, uh, uh, I won't be able to be represented anymore. Uh, uh, if you would like someone, they, they said that they would reach out if they had. I said there were a couple people that were interested. I said it's up to you to reach out. And, and maybe they thought that maybe they didn't need one, and I'm thinking that eh, this is probably a good reason why they should have one. Because I know when we were doing assignments, there was a couple people that said they would be interested in being a BI representative. So this is my message to the BI that I think you should consider someone that you would like to have and, and invite them to your meetings. So as, as the mayor said, it would be good to just have ongoing dialogue. Right. Okay. okay. So that's <laughs> new council member at the discretion of the BIA. Right. It's, it's there. It's there. It's, it's not an assignment we have. It's it's their it's at their request. Great. Thank. You. Okay. Any more comments? Um, I sense a consensus here. If I'm wrong, um, there's been a motion and a second. <coughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any in opposition? No. Okay. It passes unanimously. Thank you very much. <coughs> Moving on to D, ordinance amending chapters. Again, <laughs> this is a misprint. So we're actually going on to um, considering an agreement with the um, Santa Cruz uh, Regional Transportation Commission. Is there a report? Yes, good, me, uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Item before you is to consider entering into a memorandum of understanding with the Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission for a uh, bikeway um, signage um, project that they're undertaking. Um, as I mentioned, the Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission has been working <coughs> on several projects um, countywide to enhance and encourage bicycle riding throughout the county. Um, in 2016, they issued a Santa Cruz bikeway map that really identifies primary, secondary, and local bikeways throughout the county and it offers you know ways for people may not be familiar how to ride from Santa Cruz to Watsonville and the preferred routes um, so that map is available um, in paper edition at various locations and certainly online at the S the RTC website um, their focus right now is on implementing a wayfinding signage program 
this directs, actually provides on street signage that directs bicyclists to these preferred routes and safest routes to destinations throughout the county. Um, there's, the program includes over 300 sign locations countywide and there's approximately 20 sign locations within the Capitola in the program. So to give you an idea what the signs will look like, these are two examples that the, um, in the program document itself. So the first are these destination signs, and these are signs that come to you uh, as a bike rider would see before you get to a decision-making point, typically an intersection. And it would give you both a direction of a local destination, like in this one case here, Cabrillo College, two miles ahead, you would go straight at the intersection. Seacliff, three miles ahead, and you'd go straight at the intersection, or you turn right to go to Watsonville. So these are destination signs. They help you make a decision before you get to an intersection. Um, the other type of sign is a confirmation sign, and this typically goes after that decision making has occurred, just to confirm that you, you're going where you think you're going. And these can, don't necessarily need to go together in, in, in couplets. You can probably, the preferred is to have these before intersections, then you don't need these. You, have, you wait till you get to the next intersection. But in certain instance, instances, and certainly in Capitola, we've recommended, worked with the RTC to use the confirmation sign just to try and reduce some of the sign clutter, particularly in the village. We, we've gone with that option. Um, so this is a quick map that shows the bike routes in the county, and I realize it's a large scale, but you can all see the red lines. Those are the, the primary and recommended bike routes that go you know, south to north and north to south through the county. Um, Capitol is right through here. Park Avenue is the primary bike route. Everybody sees a lot of bike riding on that, and then it goes up Cliff Drive, and then Portola Drive is identified as the primary bike route um, east and west. Uh, through the Pleasure Point area. We all know you can go along Opal Cliff Drive and along East, along East Cliff Drive, but that's pretty congested, so their recommended route is there. Capitol Road is also a primary bike route that comes into the city. Um, and then these two, north-south, are kind of connected by 38th Avenue is the recommended route. And then Bay Avenue is a connector up into Soquel Drive, which is another east-west uh, connector in the, in, the sit in the county. So looking at Capitola, it's at these key intersections where um, we're recommending, uh, or the program is recommending signs. So we have Park, McGregor, and Kennedy all come together right here. And there's a series of signs that provide direction, you know, to Cabrillo College this way, Seacliff Beach that way, Capitola Village that way. Again, at Park in Monterey, there's a series of the directional signs. In the village, we opted more for the confirmation signs, just because it's tough to get all those signs in the village. Um, and then you'll see again signs at uh, 38th and Bromer and at 38th and um, Capitol Road. And those were selected. 38th is a much easier ride for a bicyclist than 41st Avenue. Um, I will say the, the first iterations that came from the RTC on this probably had three times as many signs and we've worked at them trying to get it down to what we feel is and, you know, something we can all live with and, and still provide the benefit that the program's after. I think it is a, a worthwhile regional project. So just to give you an idea, again, how this, this is at 38th and Bromer. This location is a little blue dot here. You'll see a sign like this, I'll have a bicycle and on one side, it will say Capitol Mall, half mile to the left, and then it'll say Capitol Village, 1.6 miles with an arrow to the right, and these two bottom lines. So you'd have the bike sign and two directional signs that would go right here before the intersection so the bicyclists can know whether they're turning right or left. And then in the village, this is going up Monterey just at the bottom of the hill before you go up Monterey. Um, well, we would add a, a confirmation sign instead of having all the signage for each option before the turn, because mainly bicyclists are gonna get here and realize they have to turn, but it will give them a confirmation, and I think it says to see cliff on this. So that's the type of signage um, we would put there. 
So the memorandum of understanding is an agreement between the city and the, S and the Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission. Um, Transportation Commission is re responsible for the development of the sign program. Um, certainly they, this has been completed and, and staff has reviewed it and we've gone over it several times with their staff. The RTC will pay for the initial fabrication of the signs and their installation. And the city will agree to maintain the signs, including replacement if necessary. Um, you know, there's not really a period, it says for the life of the signs. I think it's in, you know, anticipated that the signs will, in five to 10 years, will decide if, if they're working or not, if we're getting a lot of feedback on them, whether they're good, then we can continue to maintain them. Certainly if one were to be knocked down and destroyed next year, we'd be on the hook to replace it. Um, I really don't think that's a big deal. We don't go through needing to replace many signs in the, cell, in the city. We do replace them more for age, and that's 20 or 30 years from now, and we replace the stop sign if it doesn't get hit. Tagging does occur, which requires that you typically we can clean them. So I think we're looking at less than $1,000 a year to main these, maintain these signs for the first 10 years. So our recommendation is to consider approval of the MOU, and I'd like to quickly introduce Anna E. Schenk, who is the RTC's project manager on this. She's put in lots of hours on this, and uh, I think she has a few comments to make, and I'm sure she'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, Thanks I was. For coming tonight. I Thanks for it. having me. Um, Steve did a really good job uh, presenting this project. I actually, most of the things that I was gonna say, he's already covered. Um, I do just want to emphasize that we have worked very closely with the city staff to make sure that the signage is not intrusive, particularly in the village. We understand that that is a, uh, um, a place where there's already a lot of visual elements. Um, I guess I'll just say a few things about the importance of signage. I do get the question a lot. Um, why is this an important project? Why do we need to put up signs for bicyclists when everybody has a cell phone now? Um, we often think of cyclists differently than drivers for good reason, they're different modes. However, um, when we put up a new road or we build a new freeway, we wouldn't do that without putting up exit ramp signs. Uh, signage is just a given for, for uh, drivers. Uh, for bicyclists, it can be just as important, but there's a different need. The signage needs to look a little different, and it also needs to be uh, in different places. A bicyclist moves slower and also has to contend with uh, vehicles moving at a much faster pace. So the placement is really important. And again, I'd like to thank the City of Capitola staff for working with us so closely on that placement. Um, we also, you know, I don't know how many of you are avid cyclists, but when you're on a bike, trying to look at your cell phone is not an easy task. Um, and can be very dangerous. So this helps uh, cyclists be able to navigate the city and not just the city of Capitola, but also the Pacific Coast bike route and regional routes that run right through some beautiful um, arterials and um, collector streets within the city. So they can do that now, or they will be able to do that without having to look at a cell phone. And um, it also makes the city and, and the region a bicycle friendly place. Uh, so those are the reasons I usually give to people when they ask me why is this program important. Um, we do, uh, um, we've been working on MOUs with all of the jurisdictions within Santa Cruz County to maintain the signage. Um, as you might, I don't know how familiar you are with the RTC, but we were formerly mostly a planning organization. We are now starting to get into project delivery. We don't have uh, funds that we can easily or readily pull. Uh, to uh, pay for um, signage. Um, most of our funds were used for planning. That is changing. We do intend to look towards finding a funding source to maintain, to have a maintenance program for the signage. And um, we may even be looking to a phase two where once we've had significant changes in infrastructure, uh, we can update signage to sign relevant new facilities such as new green lanes that might um, facilitate easier access to other parts of the city. Thank you. Any questions of staff or Yonica here? I have a comment. Um, oh, excuse me, Sam. Ahead, Sorry. No, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I did have a question from staff. Um, 
My understanding is that um, the signs are meant to identify preferred routes through Capitola? They identify preferred routes through the county. So um, preferred means routes that access key destinations and routes that already have um, either bike lanes or low traffic. Uh, so they're a little bit safer. Is one of those preferred routes, um, and uh, I'm not necessarily just directing this at you, but uh, is one of those preferred routes down East Cliff Drive into the village and up Monterey and vice versa? Um, one of the routes does use East Cliff um, and then wouldn't use, uh, we have Park and then Bay. Yes, yeah. So the, the uh, just the, most the bike the route through the village goes down Cliff Drive um, and mm -hmm. kind of breaks apart a little bit as we go through the Esplanade and, and Capitol Avenue and then does go back up Monterey to Park, at Park, Drive, Park Avenue, I'm sorry. Most of the signage uh, on, the, on the tables that were presented in the staff report uh, seems to steer um, riders that are uh, heading into <coughs> Capitola um, down uh, East Cliff. Um, and up Monterey, and then on the other side, down Monterey, um, up East Cliff. Um, and I'm just questioning that is, is really a preferred, the preferred route if safety is uh, the main criteria? Um, I, Monterey is a very low volume street. Um, I personally, when I ride my bike to and from work, I like using Monterey because it's low volume. Um, you know, there are per different preferences for different types of riders. Uh, maybe it would help if you explained your concern for using Monterey. Um, I don't think I wanna sit up here and uh, take questions, um, but, um, and I would like to just direct my question um, and um, my years of experience in Capitola is that um, the hill down Monterey into the village and the hill down East Cliff into the village is not the safest route and it's not the preferred route for all types of riders. Um, so that's the nature of my concern. Um, but I think I have the answer to my question is that that is the de designated preferred route in this signage program? There are multiple routes through the village, and that is one of the routes. All of the routes we call preferred routes, but there's different classes. There's regional, um, local, and then neighborhood. Only the regional and the local ones are signed. So I wouldn't say that Monterey is more preferred or less preferred than using Park, or um, East Cliff is more preferred or less preferred than using Capitola. Uh, they're all with collectively within this program. Some of them are regional, some of them are local. I, I would add, we, we did look at the ones coming um, from west, east of Santa Cruz to ca into the village. Um, and at least in my opinion, the coming down Cliff Drive is a better option than going down Wharf Road into the village, which is the other option. Um, there's really no other way short of going up Wharf Road and then back down through, you know, over the Rispin Bridge and back, and that's pretty circuitous. So um, there are other options, um, you know, going from Monterey, they're all quite lengthy, um, involve much more interaction with crossing of traffic. So that's the shortest and most direct to go out of the village in the eastern direction. I think that's why that's... Mm -hmm nominated that way, so. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Um, have the placements of the signs been uh, evaluated for ADA compliance? I know some are embedded in the sidewalks, some are embedded in the dirt next to the sidewalks. Those shouldn't be an issue, but right. the ones that are going into the sidewalk proper? Yeah, they've all been evaluated by our now retired maintenance superintendent mm -hmm. um, has walked each site and reviewed each site. Um, and we'll do that as the installation goes through and make sure they all are ADA compliant. Right. Uh, will there be um, more technical specs about the location of the signs than what's on these uh, tables? No, that is the plan sheet. That's the plan sheet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Thank you, Steve. Um, so my question is to you. Um, is there an evaluation, well, whoever can actually answer this properly, is there an evaluation of the existing signs that are already in place? I think these have been in place in Santa Cruz and other areas, right? Uh, the only existing bicycle signage in place is for the Pacific Coast route, and we did evaluate that and have recommended removal of some of the signage so as to minimize the net new signage that would be going in. Um, the placement of the current placement of the Pacific Coast route signs do not follow best practice. Um, they're typically after the intersection or at the intersection, and if you're on a bike and need to make a left turn, you need to know prior to getting to the intersection that you need to make that turn. Um, so in some places we have recommended removing it. There's also significant gaps in the Pacific Coast bike route signage, um, particularly getting between uh, the unincorporated area of um, Portola, East Cliff, that area, and over to Aptos. Um, we were able, because that area is mostly straight, we were able to just move some signage in the plans without really generating much new locations. But we did, for what was out there, we did evaluate it. Okay, so if in working with the RTC and evaluation, we determined that some of these things do not meet our needs, um, is there means to change the location or change the placement? or the number of signs. I think that's always an option to, to continue to improve the program as, as we move forward. If we find things aren't working, we can work with uh, RTC on that. So that's always within our purview, okay. Um, having done the Pacific Coast Trail, I would hate to see the signs go, <laughs> although I did get a map. So um, any more questions of staff and RTC representative? Seeing none. Uh, any comments from the audience here for staff and RTC representative? Seeing none, bring it back to city council for guidance here. Anyone like to jump in? Well, I'll jump in, I'll start, and, and I'll just say that uh, I don't support uh, putting in these signs. Um, I think we have a great numbers of signs in this community. Um, and there's such a pollution of signs, I think people even stop seeing any particular one of them. Um, so before, with, uh, adding more signs, um, I, I would want to have a better understanding of the purpose and need for this program. Um, why, who's, why are people asking for this? Um, I don't know that that's Capitola residents. Uh, they know how to get from uh, Capitola to Soquel without having to s read a sign. Um, I am concerned, and I don't think it was addressed, about the preferred route um, uh, that going through Capitola. Uh, I think there's other routes. If you're coming down Park Avenue, you don't necessarily need to go down that hill of Monterey, uh, which we have just decided uh, you know, um, that you can't ride the bicycles on the sidewalk. Um, and you can't ride bicycles uh, on the sidewalk in the village uh, which means that young children uh, would have to navigate through the streets uh, relying on their signage. Um, so I don't think that that's well thought out. Um, you can just as well, um, on from Park Avenue to Monterey, uh, go right on Bay, and you can go through the city parking lot uh, to get to the village. That would be a much safer route and an alternative route. Um, so I think there's just many reasons uh, not to mention the cost of maintenance, uh, having to replace the signs, and so for those reasons, I'm not going to support uh, this project. Thank you, Sam. Any other comments? Yeah, um, I think uh, I'm going to take a different position on this. Uh, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with the sign program. I look at it as a countywide program, um, and sometimes one thing that's really hard that I notice is hard to do in, in the county is having a um, group project. And this is one where this is a, a trail that runs from Watsonville to Davenport and uh, encompasses the entire county. And I think there's an obligation, you know, we, we, we are trying to become, I think, a more bicycle friendly community. And uh, I know that as a, as a motor vehicle driver, there's an inundation of signs for, for vehicles. And I think this is just another way 
of helping, as was mentioned, you know, I mean, I know a lot of people do embrace technology when they're riding, and I know that it's pretty awkward, you know, even though it can be done with your phone when you're on your bike. Mm. And there was a lot of thought that went into this sign program, and, and it fit. It, it, the intent was to enhance bicycle riding through Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County, which happens to include the city of Capitola. I know that there's a, um, a concern always about, you know, excess signage, especially with regards to the village. Um, I don't find the 18 signs to be detrimental, so uh, I'm going to support the motion. Okay, I have two comments. Any others that would like to weigh in? Okay, seeing no comments, um, I will weigh in. Um, I do agree with Ed that uh, we're trying to create a um, countywide system for bicyclists. I've been a bicycle rider most of my life. Like I mentioned, I've done Pacific Coast Trail up to Washington completely enjoy the fact that there are signs along the way. Um, I'm also, I uh, have one question of staff uh, before I continue. Um, it was mentioned by the RTC rep that there will be a second phase. Uh, are you familiar with what that means? No, I'm not. <laughs> okay. Um, please um, come forward. So some of the um, bicyclist advocates that we've been working with on our Sedona Bicycle Advisory Committee and other stakeholder groups we work with uh, have asked for um, additional signage on the exist the poles that we're going to install. So for example, if you're approaching New Brighton, there's um, these sometimes little brown um, signs that have a symbol of a tent. So it would identify that there's a camping place nearby. Uh, another example of additional signage would be um, if there was a new route or a new facility where we would have to um, rethink one of the existing routes. Um, and so in that case, we we need to look at at finding a, a changing up signage and possibly purchasing new signage. Um, it was mentioned by Sam, and I could see the reason behind his comments because it's a lot easier to go through the parking lots. Would you consider that as a route, alternate route? I would have some concerns with putting bicyclists in a position where they're contending with vehicles pulling in and out of parking spaces. Um, personally, I don't think that's as safe as having a bicyclist on a roadway. I'm not sure that that would be supported by our engineer. Um, we can certainly consider other alternatives. I'm not, I'm just a little uncertain about putting somebody through a parking lot. Okay. Um, can I respond to that? Yes. And maybe we should have Sam. the engineer because I'm not sure if the village is uh, a better alternative than going through the parking lot. The village is a parking lot. People are getting in and out of their cars. They're crossing the crosswalks. The summertime there is very congested and it's congested with cars and so if that's your example of a safer alternative, I would submit that you're wrong and that we should maybe, if that's what we're hearing, we should have their engineers come and assess each one of these preferred routes so that we can determine that for, oursel for ourselves. So I just wanted to respond to that. Um, I have another question. Steve, can we, uh, choose certain areas that we want the signs in right now. Uh, it's contention right now going down East Cliff and up Monterey. So can we jump in t to this agreement with all the other signs, but not that right now until it's been evaluated and looked at? So yeah, this is uh, the signs are gonna be installed under an encroachment permit. So we have the authority to in tonight, you could approve or disapprove certain locations if that is what you want to do. Okay. Um, any comments? Uh, Ed, yeah, I, I have one more, one additional comment. Um, I, I think we need to understand that the bike lanes already exist. Right now, if you're a bike rider, you're going to be coming down Park Avenue. You're going to turn on Monterey. You're going to be in a lane of traffic through the village and then up and out of the village on an existing bike lane. Or at the minimum, it's a... Um, might be a Shero once it gets onto Stockton, if I'm correct me, I think that's, that's what happens there. But the bike riders are going to use the route that they're going to use. What we're doing is we're trying to add signs to clarify the route, and, and I don't, 
you know, I, I, I immediately when the idea was suggested of going through the parking lot, I, I, if you go through the parking lot, which I go through on, an, on the weekdays, it's a great place to cut through. <laughs> but on a weekend, uh, what goes on in that parking lot is no place that I would want to subject a bicycle rider to. I think it puts us at risk for, you know, for, for just people's habits and what they do and, you know, not being cognizant of a lot of things. And I think what's hard for us as a society to embrace is that um, there is a movement towards embracing bicycles as a way of communication, I mean, I mean of transportation. I mean, when we're talking about the corridor trail, we're talking about, you know, it could be used for e-bikes, um, and e-bikes are a whole other animal all in themselves, you know, of, of how they how they interact. And But uh, what I'm looking at this policy is, this policy is not anything to do with changing existing bike lanes or uh, traffic. It's just acknowledging that these are the paths, and, and, and if I was a bicycle rider uh, and coming through Capitola trying to get to Santa Cruz, I don't think I'd want to detour up Bay and over to Capitola, or as uh, Steve suggested, over through Peary Park and up, you know. Um, the idea is that bicycles are to be treated uh, in, in the same vein as other modes of transportation, i.e. a car, and heck, it might even be safer to get through the village on a bike than in a car, I don't know, but I, I, I I'm, I'm just thinking that there's, you know, maybe there's apples and oranges here. I can, I can appreciate the point uh, Councilmember Story makes about, you know, safety with an engineer. But I, I think if someone was going to design a route, it would, we, there already is an existing route. So w with that, I'm going to make a motion that we uh, adopt staff recommendation to install the signs as designated. Thank you for that motion. Is there a second on this motion? I'll second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Um, <coughs> Let's call for a vote. Uh, City Clerk, would you please call individuals? Councilmember Story? No. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Botworth? Aye. Mayor Bertrand? Aye. Motion passes four to one. Thank, Thank you, you very Council. much. That brings us to the end of our agenda, I believe. Right. Yes. So I call for adjournment. Thank hey, you. Happy, happy Valentine's.